begin, as uh, many of you are well comfortable hearing now, inviting all of us to together turn off our cell phones, uh, or at least put them to vibrate. So none of us is that person. Um, OK, thank you. My name is Brian Trainer. I'm a professor in the Department of Philosophy here at Loyola Marymount University, and I'm the director of the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination. As many of you know, this year, ACTI, the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, has been focusing on the theme, the idea of a Catholic university in the 21st century, where together we've been thinking through a series of events and programs about what it looks like to be a Catholic university, what is distinctive about being a Catholic university in the 21st century. We've been doing this with a number of partners on campus, most uh, prominently the Bellman College of Liberal Arts and the Bellman Forum, which has co-sponsored our programming throughout the year. Uh, as I was planning, along with my colleagues at ACTI, uh, Catherine Brown and Emilu Reyes and uh, other student workers, one of the things we thought about was LMU's place. And we thought we should get some programming that's focused on the place of LMU. And we started by thinking about place geographically only and LMU's proximity to the border with Mexico and issues related to immigration about the fact that LMU is on the Pacific coast facing Asia rather than on the East coast facing Europe. Uh, but as we started to think about place more expansively, we started to think about LMU's place in history, LMU's place in uh, institutional setting and its relationship to the Catholic Church and other Jesuit universities and other Catholic universities. And our idea about this kind of programming expanded. Uh, and our event tonight is one result of that. Uh, I confess, um, and those of you who have been to many of our events know I haven't said this before, I'm, I'm looking forward to this event and this conversation more than almost anything else we've programmed this semester uh, because of the speakers we've got lined up and because of the conversations that I hope we'll be able to have on the basis of this. I'm going to introduce all three of our speakers um, who each will give a presentation that will be followed by a Q&A period. We'll have some mics available to pass around so people can participate. Um, so our first speaker is Marsha Chatlin. She's an associate professor of history and African-American studies at Georgetown University. She's the author of Southside South Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration. She's a public voice on the history of African-American children, race in America, and social movements. In 2014, she organized scholars in a social media response to the crisis in Ferguson, Missouri, in a way that took off and was a model for um, other initiatives online and shaped curricular projects in high schools and in academia. Uh, Professor Chatlin is one of those people that makes the rest of us feel a little bit lazy when you look at her <laughs> resume here. It's, it's daunting, and I won't be able to do justice to all of it. All of the places she's contributed, both in academia and as a scholar, and uh, I think equally admirably as a public voice um, to The Atlantic, to Time, to The Chronicle of Higher Education, MSNBC, CNN, BBC, PBS. She hosts a weekly podcast that talks about millennials and what's most important to them. She was named a top influencer in higher education by the Chronicle of Higher Education, and she's currently enjoying a research leave under the funding of the National Endowment of the Humanities. Um, Professor Chatlin really has accomplished an enormous amount of stuff. She will be our first speaker um, and give a somewhat longer presentation because among the other things I've referenced, she's also a member of Georgetown's Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation which attempted to, at the invitation of the president of Georgetown University, attempted to recognize and come to terms with the relationship between Georgetown University and the institution of slavery and think about what that meant for Georgetown in contemporary time. It's a very difficult task, and uh, what happened at Georgetown, I think, is an interesting, potentially an interesting model for lots of other institutions dealing with a past that is less than perfectly admirable, right? How do institutions deal with the legacy of past evils, with past injustices in the present? Our next two speakers are going to follow up for that precisely because Loyola, Mary, Loyola Marymount University doesn't have exactly the same relationship with the past, with the institutions that Georgetown has. It's a, it's a different environment. And one of the things we were thinking about that could be relevant to our time and place is the treatment of indigenous persons in the American West 
uh, by European colonial settler civilization in general, but the Catholic Church in particular, the mission system, the residential school system, and uh, other legacies of the ways that indigenous persons in the American West were exterminated and assimilated. So our next two speakers will speak to that context of Loyola Marymount dealing with a particular historical reality, even if it's one that is not as closely connected to LMU as Georgetown's connection to slavery was. Our first speaker in the second part of the panel is Tracy Voyles, who many of you may well know as a, an associate professor and current chair of the Women's and Gender Studies Department here at LMU. She's the author of Wastelanding, Legacies of Uranium Mining in the Navajo Country, and the winner of the Border Regional Libraries Association's Southwest Book Award. Her research interests revolve around environmental justice, environmental history, feminist theory and gender studies, ecofeminism, and comparative ethnic studies. Her current project is Bound for the Sky, the Salton Sea, and the Impossibilities of American Environmentalism in the Borderlands. Our final speaker will be Amanda Wixon, who is currently a PhD student in Native American history at the University of California in Riverside. She also serves as the assistant curator at Sherman Indian Museum in Riverside. She's a contributor and co-editor co -editor to the upcoming book, Sharp Minds, Strong Voices, 20th Century Activist American Indian Women of the American West. Her research interests are public history, American Indian identities, boarding school histories, and Native American art. And her dissertation will focus on the built environment of the Sherman Institute, which is now Sherman Indian High School, and methods of assimilation used to, quote, civilize Native youth. She's a Chickasaw Nation tribal member and a granddaughter of a graduate of the Chilico Agricultural Indian School in Oklahoma. So please join me in welcoming our speakers. I'm looking forward to a spirited conversation. Good evening, everybody. Um, it is wonderful to be at LMU, um, another Jesuit institution, and to see the preservation of the great Catholic tradition of no one sitting in the front row. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a very special place to me for a number of reasons, um, but uh, Father Michael Caruso, who used to be on the faculty here, is now the president of St. Ignatius College Prep, my first Jesuit institution, that I think um, in many ways offered a vocabulary that allowed me to continue in college and graduate school and my career today to really think about the unique, the unique role that college, Catholic colleges and universities play in promoting social justice and also creating a culture of reflection about our past and a series of challenges that we can put in front of us. Um, is there a question? Or is it here? Right. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about. Today, are we recording? So today I'm going to talk to you about an experience um, that I had as a member of Georgetown's working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. And there are a few things that I think are important to keep in mind when we think about a contemporary reflection about slavery in the United States. I learned a lot of things in graduate school. I don't remember most of them, but I do remember this um, reflection that was offered to me by James Campbell, who is now a professor at Stanford University. He said, if we look at the entire experience of <clears throat> humankind and of civilizations, slavery is not interesting because it is consistent with human history. It's the fact that it ever ended that we have to think of as remarkable. And in similar ways, we also have to think about our institutions, their location, their age, and their level of prestige, and understand that slavery is at the center of that process. And so when we would be interviewed by members of the press or people at various events, and they would say, well, did you think it was shocking that Georgetown Re relied on slavery for its growth and expansion, that we have to remind ourselves that although the terror of slavery is something that appalls us, the fact of slavery is something 
that when it shocks us, it shows that we have failed to really understand um, what was at stake in the past and where we stand in the present. So the, the fact of Jesuit slaveholding is also an issue that I think became very important when we launched this initiative, because I think there was an impulse to say, well, wasn't slaveholding a Jesuit problem and not a Georgetown problem? Or wasn't this an issue of a university and not an, or, an, an, uh, an order of priests? And I think that that's very dangerous thinking. Because if we think about the Catholic tradition, that its strength is in its ability to unite disparate people all over the world, then the fact of slaveholding also bounds us together. And so we know that Jesuits arrived in Maryland as early as 1634. Our archives tell us that Jesuit slaveholding was a fact of Jesuit life as early as 1717, and we know that Georgetown was founded in 1789. Like many Catholic institutions, Georgetown could not charge tuition, and so it depended on its assets, including the human beings that toiled on plantations in nearby um, White Marsh and parts of Southern Maryland in order to sustain itself. Slavery at Georgetown has been well documented, but until 2015, I don't think this history really animated the choices we made as an institution. And I think that distinction is very important also. There was an element of the storytelling, if you read the stories in the New York Times or you watch CBS News, that you know we were in a very long episode of History Detectives where everyone was so ignorant to this fact, someone found a box of documents, and now we know this reality. That is untrue. There was also another element where I think um, people were imagining this was also like spotlight, that there was this hidden conspiracy and that we were the ones who were exposing it. And that's also false. The reality is, is that scholars have long written about this topic. This is something that Anyone who can get access to the archives on campus of the, the Maryland Jesuits can see the documents, the bills of sale, the baptismal records, the death records of Georgetown's property. This is something that was always there. The question is, why in 2015 did this issue become particularly important to us as a community? And so there, was, there were a few precipitating events. One was the reopening of two residence halls that were named after two Jesuit leaders who facilitated a sale in 1838 of 272 children, women, and men in order to ensure Georgetown could retire some debts and continue to operate as a university. And so in 1838, they entered an agreement to sell 272 people to Louisiana plantation. And if you, if you have a cursory understanding of slavery, you know what that means to sell people into bondage into those conditions in the state of Louisiana. One of the other correctives that I think is important to make is the 272 does not represent the entire body of men, women, and children that toiled on behalf of Georgetown. We know that this sale in 1838 was significant, but we have yet to fully comprehend how fundamental slavery was to the building and maintenance of the university. If you've read Craig Wilder's excellent book, Ebony and Ivy, where he talks about the relationship between colleges and universities and slavery, he talks about practices as diverse as universities using their own slave labor to build buildings, students bringing slaves with them onto campus to attend to their needs, and the practice of renting labor from other slaveholders in order to do tasks on campus. And so when you think about the ways that the slaveholding economy was so central to colleges and universities, you move away from this idea that if we make peace with the 272, then we finish the work of grappling with this history. So what were we asked to do? The Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation was asked to make recommendations on how to best acknowledge the university's relationship to the institution of slavery, examine and interpret the two residence halls that were scheduled to reopen, Milady and McSherry Halls, and convene events to share the history and initiate dialogues about this history. And so we were so naive when we started doing this. I've never seen a group of people who had no clue 
that this would mean anything to anyone outside of our gates. I went to Brown University in the early 2000s when Ruth Simmons initiated the Brown University uh, Slavery and Justice Committee. And it was a multi-year initiative that drew a lot of attention from um, a certain element of the right-wing press. It was called the Reparations Committee. David Horowitz came to campus to suggest that this was a horrible takeover of the university by um, kind of radical thinking. And having observed that process, I thought to myself, no one will ever do this again because it felt so politically risky and it also required the public to understand something about history that it couldn't fully comprehend. And so more than a decade later, to be a faculty member doing this kind of work, I thought, well, Ruth Simmons tried to do it in this way. It got some attention, but it kind of blew over. We would just write this report. People at Georgetown would think about it, and no one else would care. Little did I know. But when we look at the context in which we were doing this work, that was an impossible possibility. When we convened the working group in 2015, we were about two months from the tragedy in Charleston, South Carolina, where nine African Americans were killed while attending a prayer meeting at the Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. And the idea of religious violence happening in this context and the connection to the use of the Confederate flag in the center of South Carolina opened up a new conversation about symbols. Um, I remember debates about the Confederate flag, about the University of Mississippi football team, Jesse Jackson's various interventions to try to retire the flag, um, but it seemed like there was still space for this flag to remain. But after this massacre, I think it gave people pause, and I think the fact that at the time, Nikki Haley's strong kind of condemnation of the flag really changed the tide. And so we were a few months from Charleston when we convened our group. There was no denying that the movement for black lives and the activism that we had observed after the killing of Michael Brown in 2014 also inflected our conversation because our students and the surrounding community in Washington, D.C. was engaged in a conversation about the uh, pervasive legacy of not only slavery, but Jim Crow and of segregation. And so I think that we were also moved to think about the struggles that our students were entering in 2015 as we did this work. Student protest movements at universities like Yale over Calhoun College. Um, by the fall, our work was very much in conversation with the protests at the University of Missouri, my alma mater. And this question about what does a college campus do in terms of mediating racial discord? The Calhoun College issue was also important because for us, it was um, the initial charge was framed as what, we were, what were we going to do about the building? And we knew that it would be incredibly dangerous to confine our work to the idea of do you rename a building or do you not? That is easy. I could do that every day. <laughs> Thinking about the significance of the renaming and what we wanted to teach each other as a community was far more difficult. And Pope Francis had come to visit. Um, and it was so exciting because you didn't have to go to work um, because of the traffic. Um, but more than anything else, I think um, Pope Francis's visit to Washington, D.C. as a Jesuit pope um, in a moment in which he was talking about the evils of racism and capitalism um, I joked with my students that Pope Francis would have gotten an A in my civil rights class because when he spoke at the White House and he quoted Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, he didn't quote the parts that we know about content of your character. He talked about Martin Luther King using the metaphor of a bum check, that African Americans had been written a bad check from Reconstruction, and this was the time for reparations. So I give Pope Francis an A for that. And so the framework in which we were doing our work, um, just to say what we did. So we had to look at this issue of the building. And we knew that we were going to rename the buildings. But halfway into the semester, students staged a sit-in at the office of President Jack DeJoya, demanding the changing of the names. We wanted to respond to the student protest without being hasty in choosing new names. And so the 
halls were temporarily renamed Freedom and Remembrance in recognition of the work we were going to do. And then we settled on two names. The two names that we chose were Isaac Hawkins Hall, because Isaac Hawkins is the first name that appears on the Bill of Sale in 1838. Isaac, um, the name Isaac had um, obvious biblical meaning to us. And this idea that students who resided in that hall would always recognize the sacrifice that was made in order for Georgetown to continue. Um, the second name was um, chosen from a suggestion from an alum, and that's Anne Marie B. Craft Hall. Anne Marie B. Craft was a free woman of color who lived in Washington, D.C., who worshiped at the Holy Trinity Church in Georgetown and established a school for girls in the district and later had to flee. Uh, because of racial violence, and joined the Baltimore-based um, uh, Oblate Sisters of Providence. And we wanted to recognize the long history of African-American Catholics in the Northeast in renaming the hall after her. Archives. We wanted to make sure that the materials about this history were available not only in a digital sense, but to think about the incredible power we had as a university to let people recreate and retrace their story back to our campus. For many of us, our college campuses can feel like gated communities with lots of security, with a culture in which outsiders don't feel welcome. So what did it mean to say to people, we have this information, we may have information about your own family's history, come to campus and we'll talk to you about it. My incredible colleague, the historian Adam Rothman, is known to spend his lunch break um, receiving a phone call from someone to say, I'm driving in from South Carolina, I'm driving, I'm flying in from Louisiana, can I go to the library with you? And walking over there and showing people the records of the sale of their own family. Ethics and reconciliation were also an important part of this process for us. We wanted to think about ways that the university could recognize our current demands to create an ethical culture on campus whether it's in our treatment of workers, whether it's rectifying some of the wrongs due to the displacement that is part of universities um, expanding. I think that this process illuminates an issue that has become increasingly important to me is that as members of a university community, we can't assume that universities are always benevolent forces or always good because we seek knowledge that our practices can be disruptive and harming to the communities around us. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were connecting to the local history of African American Catholics, and we wanted to set a course to create memorials, both the statue kind and the living kind to this work, and outreach. A large part of our work was about talking to people about why this was a good idea. You had to tell them why in order for them to be on board. And so a lot of that required alumni engagement because they're the ones who like to call the most. And I think they're the ones who are most confused about what kind of thing that we were jumping into. And so I'm just gonna leave you with some of the questions that have remained unanswered about this work. In April of 2016, um, the New York Times ran a story about the descendants of the 272. At the time we were working on the working group, we were not aware of this community. Um, they became visible to the press, they became visible to the university, and a project that was mostly about history had to pivot into a racial justice project. And that required us to really engage with a group of people who had grievance and had a lot of pain, not only because of what happened to their ancestors, but because of their incredible faith. Throughout this process, I think we were thinking about this in terms of research or in terms of a legalistic panic? What if people try to sue for reparations? What if they seek damages? All of these things are within the realm of possibility. But what we lost sight of was that I think our greatest strength as Georgetown University was that we were dealing mostly with people of great and deep faith, and that a mass said by Jesuits for the descendants was the most powerful thing that could be offered than a meeting or a forum to express concerns. And so in thinking about the way that this process recenters the black Catholic experience, not only in the Northeast, but in Louisiana, we were able to, I think in many ways, clarify what it means to be a Catholic university. 
Here are our opportunities. We can create an example for pure Catholic and Jesuit institutions about institutional history and practice. We have been able to host a convening of an organization called um, University Studying Slavery. We have universities from um, other Jesuit uh, communities from St. Louis throughout the Midwest, but we also have public universities that are located in the South. Their work is far more politically risky than ours. Um, we have Ivy League institutions that want to do this work. We have Ivy League institutions that do not want to do this work. We have institutions from the Caribbean and from Canada. And so in many ways, we are able to unite in common cause and recognize how regionally specific this work is and how the tone of it changes and shifts. I'm very excited to see um, California schools now contending with their history of indigenous extermination and conquest in the framework of thinking about animating future um, behavior. We have to understand the university's role in responding to ways that slavery's legacy is pervasive and insidious. This is not about um, 1838. It's about the practices of 2018 that were shaped by 1838. And we have to move beyond the stories of individuals to discuss how universities create structures of inequality. One of my concerns about the way that the narratives around the descendants has unfolded in the New York Times uh, Rachel Sprarns, who wrote the first article, is now writing a book about it. I'm sure she will win a Pulitzer. This is very exciting work. People want to hear this story. But the descendants that we have met through media um, who come to our campus for events are people with incredible levels of education. We have people who have served in the military, college professors, people who have been successful, former Catholic priests. We have a community that allows us to be comfortable with the idea of legacy. What we need to turn our attention to are the people who are languishing in America's prisons, the people who are undereducated, the people who couldn't imagine a Georgetown University or do not care to, if we really are going to take this justice work seriously. And finally, I think this type of research has the capacity to transform our campuses into places where racial justice work is generated and modeled. When we convened the working group in 2015, I thought we would eat box lunches for a year. And then at the end of 2016, we would rename some buildings and maybe do some programs. One of the things that we kept in mind is that in many ways, we got in right under the wire. If we were to initiate this work in this political climate in 2017, the trolling and the ridiculous responses to it, and we got some of that, would be outsized. And so in many ways, you can't time any of these practices, but I do think that there's something to say about establishing a foundation of practice and hopefully creating something that people want to come closer to and have the courage to do in their own context. Thank you. Hi. Um, I want to um, thank you all for being here, um, and I extend um, a big thank you um, and gratitude to ACTI um, for working so diligently to make sure that this uh, event was a success, and also for being so uh, thoughtful about the reason that we're all coming together um, tonight. Mostly, I want to thank my um, co-panelists um, for being here and for traveling to LMU uh, to be part of our conversation. So I'm going to make an effort uh, to hold to my time constraints, uh, which, as you guys probably know, is the hardest thing for a professor to do, and one of the many things that I'm proud to say that I regularly fail at. Um, nobody's taking it, right? Okay. Uh, I've been tasked uh, to talk tonight about the legacy of the mission system, and in particular what it means to be a faculty member at a Catholic university in the wake of Spanish colonization led by Catholic missionaries. So I want to preface this by saying that I am not an expert in California coastal indigenous history or politics, to say nothing of the mission system itself. 
but rather my training is in understanding the form, function, and implications of settler colonialism and white supremacy as they've manifested themselves historically in the US. So I'm going to be stretching a bit beyond um, my area of expertise and a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, but what I, what I aim to do here is to imply, apply that lens um, to a California context with the intent of highlighting a few of the ways in which we might relate to the historical and geographical place that we find ourselves in tonight. Uh, so I'll spend most of my time tonight talking about the mission system, but I want to close by offering some thoughts uh, about how we might understand our relationship to that history here at LMU as the inheritors of multiple overlapping iterations of colonial violence here in what is called the Tongue Place. Talk about the map in a moment. I want to start with a story. This story begins in early September 1771, when two Franciscan priests founded the fourth mission in the nascent Alta California mission system, overseen by Fray Junipero Serra. They called it the Mission San Gabriel Arcangel and established it on a site along the Santa Ana River in the San Gabriel Valley. So the story begins with the priests and the founding of the mission, but this is not a story about them. This story is about a nine-year-old girl who in 1771 was living in a vibrant Kumivit community in the Tongva Basin. This young girl grew up in a society more than 5,000 years old, long since established in what archaeologist Brian Fagan calls Southern California's edible landscape. The activities she learned from her mother and other female relatives would have included gathering and cooking food, weaving the baskets that did everything from carry babies to store acorns to serving as highly valuable commodities for trade all along the Pacific coast. By 1771, her early life, unlike that of her great-grandparents, would have been touched in one way or another by the infectious diseases spreading north in fits and starts from Spanish missions and military presidios in Baja California. The Colombian exchange of germs, seeds, and animals preceded their human counterparts up the coast from New Spain to reach this part of California. Perhaps in addition to exchanging, exchanging baskets and other commodities along the trading links between the, Tongva, between the people of the Tongva Basin and the Chumash Nation to the north and the Kumeyaay Nation to the south, the Kumivit people traded rumors as well of the missions in what are now San Diego and Orange Counties, of the forced labor, or of the strange practice of fencing off lands for agriculture. More troublingly, perhaps, they shared stories of Kumeyaay women and girls who had been subject to unspeakable sexual violence by Spanish soldiers, whose military role the missions were here in part to facilitate. Perhaps when she was 11, the young girl's family heard of the Kumeyaay rebellion against Spanish missionaries in the autumn of 1775, resulting in the death of Father Luis Jaime in San Diego. This is an illustration of that. However devastating the early disease epidemics were, and however troubled the people of Tongva Basin were by rumors of kidnappings and rapes in, southern, in communities to their south, these were nothing compared to what happened during this young girl's teenage years. In the short span of time from 1771 to 1780, the mission utterly transformed life in the Tongva Basin. Seeking to squash armed opposition to Spanish incursion from the Kumivit people, Soldiers defended the mission with violence and bloody spectacle, in one instance murdering an insurgent Tongva chief and mounting his severed head on a pike for the edification of other would-be rebels. In subsequent years, Spanish uh, soldiers roamed the basin, raping women and snatching children, trampling and devouring the Tongva's edible landscape, meaning that in addition to, in addition to infectious diseases and violence, Tongva people struggled with hunger and starvation. These conditions drove them by the thousands, ironically, to the San Gabriel Mission, where workforces of Tongva neophytos, or neophytes, had already been put to work growing food for missionaries and their new dependents. By 1785, just 13 years after the establishment of the San Gabriel Mission, the priests had baptized 1,200 neophytos out of an estimated 5,000 indigenous inha inhabitants of the Tongva Basin. Our heroine, now in her 20s, was not among them. Not much older than most of our students here tonight, the young girl who spent her formative years witnessing the growing influence of Spanish colonists had become a political and spiritual leader in her community. 
often described by scholars as a medicine woman or shaman, which are all-purpose stand-in words for indigenous people who have access to sacred knowledge and practices. Her name was Toy Purina. Many of you might have heard her story and heard about where she goes from here. More of you likely have not. The highlights of her tale are the stuff of legend. Having started as a shaman and having been inspired by sacred knowledge and visions, Toy Purina rallied the men of her community to attack the mission and li liberate the neophytos who lived and worked there. Toy Purina cast a death spell on the Franciscan Padres and on a moonless night in October, attacked the mission together with an alliance of several dozen men from various Tongva villages. Their attack was unsuccessful and, so and soldiers arrested Toy Purina along with 20 of her fellow rebels. Her rebellion did not end there though. At her trial, she testified that she was, quote, angry with the Padres and with all of those of this mission because they had come to live and establish themselves in her land. Toy Perina did not survive the Spanish uh, period of colonization. After her arrest in 1785, she was exiled to the northernmost presidio in the California Spanish colonial system, where she was married to a Spanish soldier for four mestizo children and died of European diseases before her 40th birthday. We're going to leave her there for now, but don't worry, we'll find her again in a moment. In the aftermath of her assault on the San Gabriel mission, the Spanish colonial system continued to develop despite resistance from indigenous nations up and down the coast of California. Missions needed labor and found it by sending soldiers to round up native people who were then transported by the thousands to missions and forced to work or forced to extreme, uh, suffer extreme corporeal punishment. Violence radi radiated out from the missions in the form of European diseases, which spread through the coastal populations into far removed tribes. Throughout, the rationale for the missions was the spread of Christianity, the lifting of barbarous souls from the darkness into the light. Missions measured their success in rates of baptisms, but paid little heed to the tens of thousands of premature deaths that resulted from overwork, infection, violence, and starvation. It cannot be denied in the end that their true purpose lay in forming a ballast for Spanish colonization of Alta California. Thus, by the time Mexico began, began secularizing the missions in the 1830s, coastal indigenous nations had experienced not just population decline, but population collapse. The Mexican period from 1821 to 1848 was in relative terms short, but dramatic. By the time of full secularization in 1834, 21,000 native people lived, in unsupp lived unsupported at the missions while their homelands were carved up for Mexican uh, ran ranchos and land grants. So this is a 1934 um, retroactive map of what the Mexican ranchos looked like in the same geography of the San Gabriel Valley. You guys will rec recognize this. When the U.S. assumed control of California again, in, uh, or California in 1848, the resulting changes for native populations were even more dramatic. Whereas Mexican law and policy had afforded some rights to native peoples, even if they were rarely implemented, the U.S. under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo re regarded native people as non-citizen, quote, savage tribes that needed to be forcibly restrained, end quote. In their drive towards statehood, white Californians affected a bloody campaign of violence against the native nations of California that, as our friend Benjamin Madley up at UCLA lays out in his recent book, amounted to an American genocide. Correspondent with the growth of cities like Los Angeles and San Diego, the native peoples of coastal California were indentured as unfree laborers, what one historian called California's own peculiar institution. They were pushed to the margins, subjected to racial terrorism of lynching campaigns, and incarcerated in prisons and on reservations. By the 20th century, most, the most densely populated area of native North America, what we now call California, was a case study in the effectiveness of settler colonial technologies of elimination. Elimination is the key ingredient of settler colonialism. What makes this form of colonialism distinct from, say, the Spanish form, is that in the US system, settlers come to stay. They effectively claim native homelands as their own to the extent that, as um, Deborah Bird Rose puts it, all a native has to do to get in the way of settler colonialism is to stay at home. The effects of elimination extend beyond the physical parameters of removal and population decline. Elimination is ideological as well. Native Californians have been systematically erased from public memory, brought to the fore only as tragic victims of unstoppable colonial forces, always relegated to the past. 
As Kelly Lytle Hernandez points out, what matters in the analysis of settler societies is not so much whether processes of native elimination and racial disappearance are consistent or ever achieved, but rather how settler fantasies perpetually trend settler societies toward these ends. Which brings us back to Toy Perina. Where is she now? Toy Perina is remembered when she is remembered as an icon of indigenous resistance to colonialism. Images such as this one, which is a 2008 mural titled Art Heals by Chicano artists Raul Gonzalez, Ricardo Estrada, and Josef Nuc Montalvo, depicts Toy Perina as a central figure in Chicano history, uh, a historical memory and experience. It's located in Ramona Gardens in East LA. This one, Honoring Our Origins is a mural by um, Hood Sisters, which is an all-women and women-identified crew based on the valley. These are two examples among several others where depictions of Toy Perina seek to reinsert her story and the story of her resistance to colonialism into public memory through the mechanism of public art. So I want to close with a few questions for our own uh, LMU community. LMU is, as we um, have pointed out, uh, was not a direct participant in the mission system. We even have the plausible deniability of the fact that Alta California missionaries were Franciscans, not Jesuits. It's important. LMU is the inheritor of multiple overlapping colonial histories, nevertheless. Spanish, Catholic, Mexican, U.S. That should inspire us to double down on our efforts at decolonization, solidarity, anti-racism, and racial justice, not the other way around. In case you feel, just a wild guess, in case you feel beleaguered by this history, brought low by the enormity of it, staggered by the task at hand, which is nothing short of decolonization, don't worry, I brought some action items. Decolonization can be both less and more than the repatriation of indigenous land, although it certainly should be that. We can do things that are doable. We can start with recruiting native faculty, investing time and money into vibrant native indigenous studies curriculum and research. We can and should establish a scholarship program to bring native California students to our campus. We can develop reverse alternative break programs that would invite native high school and community college students to come and experience LMU, to meet our faculty and to apply or transfer to study here. These are all concrete things that we can do to make structural changes to coming to terms with the Spanish colonial past, the Catholic colonial past, and the settler colonial present. We can and should do ideological things as well. You knew it was getting here, right? Things that are symbolic, things that signal to the world at large that we live our mission, we live our ideals. In the contemporary moment, when national conversations are energized around questions of monuments, racial politics, and how we remember our past, we can replace this statue of Junipero Serra with one of Toy Perina. Why not? Thank you. Hello, miyakwe, chokma, chinchokma, and chokma. Chikashasaya, my name is Amanda Wickland. It's very important to me to bring indigenous languages back into institutions like this. Miyakwe uh, means welcome in Kuya. I myself am not Kuya, but I owe it to all my friends and colleagues to say that because the area of, of California that I'm talking about is Kuya territory, as well as Luceno and Gabrielino because there was actual no real borders, everything kind of overlapped. So I'm going to go back into, kind of back up a little bit and a little overlap her presentation. After the arrival of the Spanish missionaries, the indigenous peoples of California endured, endured harsh treatment and forced labor in the name of religious conversion. In Alta, in Alta California, Indians worked as unfree people subjected to roundup and punishments at the will of uninvited Europeans. After mission secularization in 1832 and new settler migration into California, 
Indians continue to be a target for labor and racial violence. White settler demand for land and resources pressured many indigenous groups inland. During the 1840s, gold rush greed and continued racism led to the genocide of California Indians. Following statehood in 1850, settlers mainly regarded the surviving Indians as poverty-stricken nuisances. Some ranchers recognized the usefulness of Indians as a labor force. However, many natives fell victim to kidnappings and legal, an illegal form of indentured servitude similar to slavery. For native people outside of legal servitude, coexistence with settlers was anything but peaceful. Battles between ranchers and Indians highlighted a fierce competition for land and resources that decreased only with the removal and sequestering of indigenous groups. Most of these groups had already faced starvation and disease that resulted in dramatic population declines. The desperate situation in California was only part of a larger Indian problem taking place all over the United States. Efforts to assimilate Native people by encouraging private ownership of land in the form of allotments had proved unsuccessful. The revival of Native ceremonies like the ghost dance threatened the dominant white culture. Many thought that the solution to, Indian, to the Indian problem was to focus on assimilating Native youth by separating children from their families, communities, to learn the ways of respectable white Christian families. That's in Riverside. And this is the practice of placing Indians in formal educational settings began in the 17th century with Protestant mission schools, which the federal government subsidized from 1810 to 1910. The government also established a federal school system for American Indians on reservations in the 1860s and the first off-reservation Indian boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania in 1879. Army Captain Richard Henry Pratt founded Carlisle Industrial School with the aim of civilizing Indian youth by isolating from their isolating them from their communities and educating, educating them in the ways of the dominant white Protestant culture of the late 19th century. At this time, religious-based schools for Indians existed, but public opinion had swung away from Catholic schools. Many historians have attributed this to the anti-Catholic sentiment at the time, pointing to widely supported Protestant religious programming within government-run schools. In 1901, the federal government established Sherman Institute, which is currently Sherman Indian High School in Riverside. At the la as the last of the federal off-reservation boarding schools, there's 25 in total. Sherman was modeled after Carlisle Indian School. Through a program of cultural immersion, school administrators encouraged the students to shed their heathen ways by speaking only English, learning rudimentary academics, and training for a vocation. However, the largest part of the program at Sherman Institute involved sh student labor. In addition to daily lessons in and out of the classroom, students provided all of the labor on site including laundry, cooking, masonry, carpentry, gardening, farm work, and even uh, child care for the faculty. Recruitment policies for the school were, were clear in administration documents. The students had to be one quarter Indian blood and must present as Indians. That is, dark skin was preferred for enrollment. Several reports describe mission Indian agents going to reservations looking for children that seemed to be without supervision. They would then locate the parents and persuade them to release their children for formal schooling. However, oral histories tell of agents who came for the children of the community's spiritual leaders first. This recruitment practice not only targeted an entire spiritual belief system, but also obstructed the intergenerational transfer of knowledge that had been taking place for generation upon generation. From the beginning, Sherman Institute deviated from its pre predecessors. Here in Southern California, Sherman Institute also had competition. St. Boniface, a Catholic boarding school in Banning, or day school in Banning also actively recruited students, and for a time proved to be more popular among local native communities. Quite simply, parents preferred to place their children closer to home, no matter the religious affiliation. Sherman Institute administrators, however, needed to attract as many students as possible to make the school profitable. They had also promised to provide native labor for local white Christian families as part of the school's controversial but wildly popular outing program. In this program, students were hired out to families and landowners for lower than average wages, often for months at a time, sometimes year round. Outside of the school site, these students worked tire tirelessly for their employer employers who had the authority to withhold wages and privileges. <laughs> Sherman Institute also deviated from the Protestant model at Carlisle Industrial School in Pennsylvania. Res residents of Riverside assumed that most of the students would be Catholic because of their previous exposure to Catholicism at the missions 
as well as ongoing missionary efforts at Morongo, Saboba, Lusania Reservations, and Cuya Reservations from 1860 to 1880. During this period, California mission history was heavily romanticized, and, rom and Riverside promoters were eager to capitalize on the idea of a Christianized native labor force. Indeed, the buildings of Sherman Institute were designed in the mission revival style and encouraged the idea of Riverside as the agricultural heir to the missions. The first students were from a P the Pima tribe in Arizona. So-called mission Indians came next. By 1908, there were 550 students. At Sherman, with the blessing of the superintendent, the Catholic Church almost immediately started services for their students, which were held on Sundays in the auditorium with various meeting nights during the week. The Riverside's Church Federation soon sent the pastor of Magnolia Presbyterian Church to Sherman to inquire about the Protestant students. They were surprised to find that two-thirds of the students had been identified as Protestants and that many of these students had come from all over the Southwest, not just California. However, we must consider the intake process at Sherman Institute. At Sherman and almost every other Indian school, administrators insisted that students choose a religious affiliation. There were two choices, Catholic or Protestant. In some cases, the parents of the student chose the religion, but more often than not, they were assigned a religious affiliation upon enrollment. Catholic students were encouraged to attend St. Thomas Church across the street from Sherman. If they also, if they didn't want to go there, they could join any service they wanted to. As interest in the spiritual needs of Sherman students increased, the churches of Riverside decided to build a chapel for their activities. After several years of fundraising, which involved church volunteers taking students off-site off to sing for white audiences, the chapel was built across the street in 1918. After the completion of the chapel, called the Christian Union Church, religious programming intensified. A religious emphasis week was introduced, with students attending chapel services five nights a week. Riverside residents signed up to accompany students on field trips to local churches one night a week. Bible studies classes were held on campus twice a week. The religious programming also integrated the school's outing system, and students would clean the chapel and staff quarters for a few dollars a week. The chapel also hosted volunteer mother and daughter and father and son banquets, providing substitute Christian parents for Sherman students. Father and daughter and mother's son banquets were also held, but only for a short time. Despite the active participation of Sherman students, follow-up reports indicate that many former students did not feel comfortable joining non-segregated churches in their communities, and many abandoned the religious practices they learned at school. As the population of Riverside grew, many new religious groups in the area looked to Sherman for new members. Over the next several decades, the influence of certain groups largely depended on the school's administrators. One superintendent in the 60s, a Seventh-day Adventist, established a church office on the school grounds to make appointments for interested students. Although this violated federal Indian school policies, this office remained in use for over a decade. More recently, certain other administrators have encouraged certain dom denominations over others and allowed access to students they would not have received otherwise. It has been reported by students that many of these groups have encouraged the students to shun the beliefs of their parents and communities. So I'll kind of wrap it up the a good story, I guess. Fortunately, the new administration of Sherman has put a stop to this. In 1916, or 2016, Sister Mary Yarger became the principal, and while on the surface they might seem an odd choice for a federal Indian school, her appointment is rather a unique case. Sister Mary's grandmother was a student at Sherman Institute in the early years of the school, and her grandfather was a non-native teacher at the school who married her grandmother after she graduated. Almost a century later, their granddaughter, a Catholic nun who is also native, is now in charge of the school where they met. As principal, Sister Mary does not allow any religious group that encourages students to leave their native culture behind. Religious groups are allowed to hold occasional events for students, but they are strictly supervised by school staff, and at no time are students taken off campus for religious events. Currently, there is a weekly Bible study for inter interested students, but it is led by a Native staff member. Overall, the religious component of, Sherman, of the Sherman of the past represents white settlers' attempt to disrupt the spiritual lives of Native people. Their efforts broke the chain of traditional knowledge about the land and relationships with the land that had been passed down for generations. This tragic loss of culture is a legacy of generational trauma. After leaving school, many former students felt isolated and removed from their community. Loss of language and the knowledge of tribal history and traditions made it a struggle to reassimilate. These losses and feelings, combined with a history of abuse they suffered at school, caused many former students to turn to alcohol and drugs. The consequences of this are now felt by their children, grandchildren, and the entire community.
Thank you. So we've got some time for Q&A from the audience. And we've got mics on both sides that we can hand off to people. Any brave students? <laughs> We can, the students can warm up while we get the first question. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Tracy, Marcia, and uh, Amanda. Uh, all very interesting. This is not less a question than probably a comment. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a German historian. German historians make comments. Uh, <laughs> and then ask if you agree, and that's their question. Um, I, so I am an alumna of Georgetown. Uh, and I will say that as I've watched what the working group has done over the past few years, um, I've been incredibly proud to be an alumna of Georgetown. Uh, I think that the university, for all its many faults, um, has also dealt with this issue in an incredibly thoughtful um, and in-depth way. Uh, and as a historian, I particularly appreciate the way in which it is so deeply, deeply, deeply grounded in historical thinking um, and in the archives and in thinking about how the past informs and shapes the future. And I, I'm, I'm struck by, I guess it was part of Brian's introduction and then in Tracy's talk as well, the idea that here at LMU, because we're a young university, right, we were founded in the 20th century, all that bad history was well behind us, that we somehow think that we've, we've gotten, we're off the hook, right? Um, and I, I, Tracy, I appreciate your sort of action items, but I also wonder how we as a, an, an institution can deal with the history of settler colonialism and of our inherited um, benefits and privileges and, and whatnot. And, and more generally with the, not just around indigenous peoples, but also around the particular history of Los Angeles, because I think there's, there's more that we have to deal with as an institution. Um, because I certainly have been frustrated by our, I don't want to say unwillingness, but the fact that we've just not really thought about our history of place, right? Um, you know, if you go down and look at our, our, our exhibit about the Tongva people, uh, it's shameful um, and it's embarrassing. Uh, and it's not that this is necessarily all that removed to past in many ways. Um, so I wonder, and I guess this maybe is a challenge to the whole room, I mean, how do we do that kind of very deep historical work at a, a university that likes to think it doesn't really have a history. Like I said, just a comment. <laughs> Can I make a quick suggestion? Um, I think one place to start is that we have two world-class historians of racial politics in LA here in BCLA, Nick Rosenthal and Marnie Campbell. Um, and I think that that Oh, there she is. Hi, Mark. I didn't even know you were here. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's more to say, Elizabeth, about what you just brought up, but I think that um, the expertise of Nick and Marnie might be um, one place to begin. So, but I'll start here. I think that um, one of the things that's been really important to me is to talk about um, a point that Craig Wilder makes in his excellent book about when people think about universities and slavery, they think about um, the first kind of two obvious ones, right? That um, the people who built an institution and maintained it, the money generated to create institutions, but he says this third thing that I think is so important. He said that it was the scholarship and the research that happened at major colleges and universities about racial supremacy and racial ideologies that also allowed the system to continue. So this idea that we have a responsibility to generate knowledge that is not degrading and upholds systems of oppression, I think is really powerful because um, I think particularly schools in the West and the Northwest can retreat in a kind of racial, and modern universities, right? 20th century universities can say, um, can claim racial innocence. But when we think about how important ideology is, 
in allowing these structures to continue and to grow and to shape shift even after the end of slavery, then it presents a new question about what is a university and what are its um, ways that it engages with the common good. And so I think that there is an important way of introducing this history, there's this like, shen, there's some nonsense going, there's a lot of nonsense going on in our country right now. I'm gonna, okay, I, I'm, join, I'm going in a different direction, but I'll return. <laughs> okay, so all of this nonsense about Confederate memorials after the terror attack in Charlottesville was amazing to me because people were concerned that if you take down a statue, you remove history. But one of the things that I thought was really important for me as a professional historian is to tell people that my job is not to make statues or to create bizarre hero worship. I think there's something deeply Freudian in our culture, the need for heroes. That's like really sick, messed up stuff. My, that's not what we do. So if you are concerned about the loss of history, spend some time investing in history education. Don't tell your kids not to major in it. Give a few dollars to an archive in your end of the year giving. If you are concerned about the degradation of the past, then invest in resources that are actually about preserving the past in ways that are intellectually grounded and not ideologically false. And so in many ways when um, you know, people say, well, what can a university do? It was such a long time ago. Um, well, what do we do as universities? We uphold certain ideologies, we produce knowledge, and we ensure that we have a public that can make reasonable decisions about major issues that's grounded in actual knowledge instead of whatever kind of like sick family system that we're all trapped in. I mean, I'm married to a therapist, clearly. So that, like, there's a place in which that gets worked out, but there's a way that we can actually do public policy and respond to problems that are intellectually grounded and that are sound. I'll just add in there really quickly. Um, I think that this this that this framework that you provide is one of the reasons why, um, Amanda, the work that you um, are doing is so important in, in a place like the Sherman Institute because that's not just about um, sort of interrogating a particular uh, history in a particular place, but also histories of how knowledges are produced um, for students um, and how knowledge and scholarship has participate, participated in, in settler practices of, of assimilation and cultural elimination. So I just see connections there. I think that that work is so um, rich in that, in that sense. Thank you all, what a wonderful panel and, um, and, and uh, series of talks. Um, following up on Elizabeth's uh, suggestion or that we don't have a history uh, here at LMU that we pay much attention to, and just the thought of our, uh, the, the actual, well, what about the actual place? In fact, we've, we've heard there were a series of um, articles in Loyolan and in other, other local newspapers about 10, 15 years ago regarding the excavation that took place right over here. So this actual property, it's probably a lot like slavery at Georgetown in terms of that it's, this property has a history that, you know, wouldn't be terribly hard, like who, who, who had it before Howard Hughes, and who had it before him, and, and et cetera, and on and so far back. I think we are looking for the willingness institutionally to, uh, to get out of that. I'm sorry, it's, it's a comment, and do, do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly think that a lot more um, groups, uh, Gabrielinas and Tongvas, who this land belongs to, um, are more willing now to, as, be, as a result of other institutions like the Autry, which I also work at, <laughs> um, they're more willing now to talk and to offer suggestions on, on how to move forward. This is, there is the burial ground down somewhere close. Yeah, this is all ceremonial, ceremonial land. I mean, this is extremely sacred to, to Tongva. So I think just inviting them to come is a huge step. They might not accept, but they will eventually. And so, you know, Indians play the long game. <laughs> so as long as you, as long as you keep on, you're persistent and you show um, true interest in their histories, then they they come and they're willing to participate in talks like this. Okay. Um, some of the interesting 
uh, Pacific Standard Time exhibits that have been going on around the Southland have uh, concerned the intersection of uh, Native Latino uh, histories and place, uh, and some of those in relationship to the mission. So there's a very interesting kind of uh, whitewashed um, exhibit at the Santa Barbara Historical Museum on uh, the, the blending of Chumash and missionary uh, ritual. And uh, the historical pieces are, are or, or sections are kind of, you know, really sanitized. But the contemporary pieces are really looking at the revival of blending of ritual practices and objects. Um, and then I was also reading about the potential canonization of black elk. And so I guess I'm curious about, uh, particularly for Tracy and Amanda, your thoughts on uh, a contemporary uh, Native Catholic voice, both on the sacramental side, but also on the uh, cultural uh, side of that. It can, uh, that could be problematic, um, <laughs> simply because uh, uh, it's a sticky situation. One Indian group does not speak for all Indian groups, and I think you have to go in first knowing that. And so it involves a lot of communication with a lot of different communities. And even within that community, certain people will offer more information than others, and then if they have a government change, that could have a problem as well. So. Um, I think that there's certainly, it's an interesting topic. I'm sure a lot of people would like to see something like that, but you really have to, it has to come out, out of a university or something a little neutral ground because there is a lot of, uh, ba some bad relationships between tribes about owning knowledge. So I think you have to tread lightly on that one. <laughs> I also, sir, I think I might, um See, this is such an interesting question, and and I think that there, there. Are, I mean, it's a it's a complicated history, but there's resonance for me in Marsha what you were talking about with um, I wrote it down. Recentering the Black Catholic experience is a mean of means of clarifying what it means to be a Catholic or a Catholic university, um, and I I wonder if there. I mean, so so. Again, um, the, you know, having it be such a complicated experience and, and the ways in which um, sort of Catholicity played out for indigenous communities here and, and the way that religiosity integrated, you know, is integrated within um, all sorts of people's different identities. I wonder if there are ways of thinking um, about not just thinking about in indigenous people and nations as being Catholicized, but rather thinking about the ways that Catholicity has been indigenized yeah. um, in, in ways, so sort of decolonizing those frameworks. Um, why, do they, uh, why do they have to be owned by the settler? Um, why can't um, Catholicity be um, indigenous? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of my element, though, um, in, in suggesting that. I know that there's work on it, and in different um, contexts of different Native nations, it means very, very different things. So I, I don't want to be reckless in the kinds of suggestions that I would make about that, but I have a, a friend and cohort um, from grad school <laughs> who used to do this um, brilliant riff, which I cannot replicate, um, about um, how he, he was going to um, uh, decolonize Pokemon, right? And the, the settler couldn't have Pokemon. That was an indigenous cultural expression, and he was going to prove it. Um, and, and I think a lot about that. Like, why does the settler have to own the narrative on that? There are ways to decolonize things that we don't think of as explicitly indigenous. So there's, there's something there, I think. Um, but, but, yeah. In a, in a different way of thinking about this, as a 20th century historian, I think that um, even kind of um, recasting the chronology also is a really powerful tool. Um, you know, everyone was buzzing about Oprah's Golden Globe speech because she mentioned Recy Taylor. Recy Taylor is interesting because 
one of the best books about Recy Taylor was about just upending the chronology of the civil rights movement and saying, well, what if it wasn't what what if it wasn't the Montgomery bus boycott, but it was the fact that Rosa Parks was investigating sexual assault. So what if we started the timeline in 1946, and let's say it ended in 19 you know 74, um, when Joan Little gets acquitted for killing um, you know a white man who phys- who sexually assaults her. That's a different chronology. And when you present that to students, it shows t- it it's the experience of them af- actively unfixing a timeline that is embedded with so many politics and so many assumptions about what are the important events and who shapes it. And so I think that we are at a point, hopefully in the profession as historians, um, public historians, that we can do that kind of work and we can show people what we are doing as we do it to imagine a different possibility for this type of engagement. Um, so we've, we've heard a lot about different, um, groups, um, tonight that have been exploited by Catholic, um, the Catholic religion and particularly universities. Um, I'm just wondering why we didn't hear anything, and this is kind of a question for the whole room, why we didn't hear anything about young men that have been exploited by, um, Catholic, just the, the Catholic religion and specifically priests. So, like, I'm just wondering if that, if we, why we didn't acknowledge that. Do you mean that um, an acknowledge of the the pervasiveness of, of sexual abuse? Is that yeah. what you mean? Um, I, as someone who's speaking about a certain historical context of a of a you know Catholic institution, I would hate to um, I would hate if my presentation were to suggest that I don't think that's important or I don't think that's valuable. I do think that the experience of Catholics grappling with the fact that they were either complicit with or questioned um, claims about sexual abuse has been very helpful in us expanding the conversation about racial justice because I think that the response, um, both the pastoral response and the institutional response of taking very seriously claims about communities that people are both very committed with and also have been harmed by has been really helpful in thinking about the various ways that religion does harm. So I'm glad that you raised that because I also think that our work would be limited without that courageous work of other people who are questioning not only um, the individual abuses that they experienced, but an institutional context that doesn't allow for the possibility to even recognize it. So I appreciate that. Yeah. 